Okay, so I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about what Sanofi Pasteur plans to do in the next uh, decade to both grow and to strengthen its business in the emerging as well as the developed markets. Forward-looking statement. Okay, in, in, in order to, to talk to you about these topics, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover three things and I'm going to come back and review the two most important. Well, the first thing we're going to talk about is how we plan to expand the market, and this will be focused primarily on ways to ensure that we have innovation, and that includes both partnerships and acquisitions, which I look at as sort of a type of partnership. How we access new products and technology, and how we leverage industrial capabilities, which is one of the most important things that you really need to consider if you're going to globalize vaccines. And finally, the summary on how we continue to grow in both the emerging markets as well as the developed markets. Now the vaccine market you've heard from several speakers is actually quite attractive right now. My numbers are not quite as rosy as theirs are and I actually prefer theirs to mine, but if you take a look at the vaccine market from 2005 to 2015, it's projected to grow at about 10%. So good, strong, double-digit growth. And, uh, and that's good. It's driven primarily by the fact that there are large unmet medical needs uh, the fact that there's a high degree of innovation in the industry at this point, and there's relatively limited exposure to generics or to biosimilars. And I should also mention that uh, manufacturing, because of that generic point, is a, really a strategic asset for most vaccine manufacturers. With the kinds of demographic shifts that we're seeing, particularly with the ability to pay for products, there's also improved pricing opportunities. And I think up to this point, it's pretty clear that prevention is better than therapy in almost all cases to try to deal with these diseases. Now, one of the things that's very important for us is to have a solid R&D pipeline. And it's important for every company, whether they're large or whether they're small. And what I've done here is I've shown the R&D pipeline that we have from clinical development on. So you've got phase one, phase two, phase three, and registration. The total of 15 products there. And I've sliced this to try to focus you on what products are being developed for the so-called developed world as well as which are being developed for the emerging markets and the ones that are being developed globally. And this is a very important category for us. If I showed you this slide 10 years ago, it would be primarily blue. And if I show you this 10 years from now, it will probably be 80% red. Okay. So the shift is really quite dramatic, and you've heard many speakers talk about this today. If you look at phase one, three out of the four products, tuberculosis, strep pneumo, rotavirus, are destined for the emerging markets. In phase two, two out of five, two rabies vaccines. In phase three, a hexavalent pediatric combination product and our dengue vaccine. So there's, there's quite a significant emphasis now on vaccines for the emerging markets. And I'm going to focus on two. The first one is a C. diff vaccine, Clostridium difficile, and the second is a dengue vaccine. I'm going to take the dengue first because it's in phase three now. Now dengue, I think you know, is a disease which affects roughly 50% of the people in the world because 50% of the people, 2.5 to 3.5, live in the tropical or subtropical regions. And in fact, if you take a look at the picture on the right-hand side, you're going to find that it's almost a band or a swatch that grows across the globe, and those are the tropical and subtropical regions. It has an annual incidence of about 230 million cases, and unfortunately, too many of these are severe, and even more unfortunately, 90% of those are in children. There are 25,000 reported deaths per year for dengue. And it's very clear that dengue is starting to spread. No one had heard five years ago about dengue in the United States, but now we see it in Florida and we see it in some of the southern states. There's a relatively high economic burden. It's an Arbo vaccine, uh, I'm sorry, an, an, an Arbo-born vaccine. It's mosquito-born. It's the second uh, most widespread tropical disease after malaria. And if you focus just on Asia Pacific and on Latin America, it's actually number one. At the present time, there are no effective drug treatments for this viral disease, and there's no effective prevention for a disease which starts off with first symptoms that look like influenza and can come back with second symptoms on reinfection that look like a hemorrhagic fever. Now, we've looked at many approaches to try to develop a, a dengue vaccine. The first partnership that we put together on dengue was in 1997. So this has not been a quick vaccine to develop. 
The approach that we've focused on is one which is a tetravalent vaccine, which addresses all four serotypes of dengue. It's a combination of a yellow fever backbone with the important envelope antigens for dengue incorporated into what we call a Chimeravax construct. And to date, we've been able to show that all four of these constructs are stable genetically. We've been able to manufacture them under GMP conditions at large scale using viral cell culture and serum-free medium. We've demonstrated good safety profiles so far in about 6,000 patients, and by the end of this year, we'll have data in 40,000 patients. So we have a large number of trials ongoing right now. We've seen good seroconversion rates for all of the serotypes, and the efficacy study is planned to start in the fourth quarter of 2012, about 18 months from now. So it will be in Asia, and it will be in four to 11-year-old patient population. The next takes you in a different direction. The C. difficile is a so-called nosocomial disease. Uh, it's become a very frequent hospital-acquired infection, and CDI, or Clostridium difficile infection, is present worldwide. And the understanding that it is present worldwide is growing, and it's helping to drive the need for the vaccine. In the US, the EU, and Canada, it's no longer just a nosocomial pathogen. You see a lot of it popping up in nursing homes. In fact, about 55% of the cases, more than 50% of the cases, are coming in the community-acquired environment as opposed to being uh, in, the, in the hospital setting. The emergence of also what we, what's called the hypervirulent strain, which are strains which tend to be quite toxic. They have increased morbidity, they have increased mortality, and they also tend to be antibiotic resistant, is also something that's driving the need for the vaccine. The existing treatment options consist of antibiotics, and, and by and large, they're lacking. Uh, of the patients that experience a CDI infection, about 20% go on to relapse. And those patients that have a second relapse, 65% of them will become chronic CDI patients. And you see a picture over on the right of pseudomembranous colitis, which is one of the, the chronic conditions that can exist with CDI infection. Um, Extension of hospital stays for nosocomial infections is clearly a burden, not only to the patient, but also to the healthcare system. We estimate this burden at about $7 billion annually in the US and, and EU alone. So prevention is clearly going to be a better way to go than continued therapy. Now, the C. diff vaccine that we have right now consists of a vaccine against both A toxin and B toxin. It's being developed primarily for the prevention of primary disease, and the target population is adults who are at risk. So we're talking about people who are in planned hospitalization situations, people that have elective surgery, people who have wounds, people who have burns, long-term care, nursing home residents, and adults with any comorbidities which are apt to have them in the hospital for a prolonged period of time. We've completed phase one trials with this vaccine in about 200 patients, and so far it's been well tolerated in both the adults and the elderly, which is the target population. There's a phase two study which is now enrolling, and SIBA has granted this fast track uh, designation for program development. If you look over on the left, you'll see some data which is coming from both the young and the elderly. So study 008 is in 18 to 55 year olds with an average of about 26. You'll see good responses against both the A and the B toxin after 60 to 70 days post-vaccination. The same thing is more or less true of what you see in age 65. The response is not quite as strong, which is what you'd expect in, in seniors or the elderly. I have to watch out because I'm almost there myself now. And, uh, but we do see after 60 to 70 days, we do see a good healthy response. So it's very positive early indication in terms of the CDF vaccine. Now, the second thing I wanted to talk about is how we access new products and technology, because I hope I've more or less convinced you that it's one of the most important things that we do in terms of trying to, to grow our business. I'm going to show you the same R&D slide again, but this time I'm going to slice it differently. So this is the same 15 vaccines in all stages of clinical development. But if I slice it in terms of which are partnered and which are unpartnered, you're going to find that about 70% of the products are partnered. And if I was to show you the preclinical pipeline, which would be just to the left of this, it would be about 85% of the products that are partnered. So innovation is something which is, is very difficult for any one company to capture. You can do it for a single product, you can do it for platform technology and apply it to several products in a good situation. 
But if you're a, a company that's involved in making vaccines with large portfolio balance and interest in both developed and emerging markets, you're going to be dependent to a very large extent on the outside for innovation, which is a good news for partnering. So of these 15 vaccines, you're going to see that about 10 of them here are clearly partnered, including registration phase, phase three, phase two, and all of phase one. Okay. I'm going to highlight a couple of them. Last year in January, we put a deal together with California-based Calabios for a vaccine to prevent Pseudomonas originosa infection. Okay. This is a, a recombinant Fab Prime antibody fragment. And uh, this is going to be used for people who are treated with ventilation, intubation, things like this. And I think a lot of you know that most of the serious pseudomonas originosa infections occur in those that are hospitalized long term and in those that are either critically or chronically ill. The second partnership that we put together in mid-2010 was with a company called Vivalis. This is for the Humilex technology. It's a technology to make uh, and not only to make, but to, to discover and develop fully human monoclonal antibodies. Uh, this is, we believe it's a very potent platform. It's been a very good platform for us so far. The focus that we have is in the infectious disease area, and I think you know that human antibodies can be used both in a therapeutic and a diagnostic application. And interesting, we're finding that more and more diagnostic applications are starting to go hand in hand with vaccine applications. So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting blend which has never really been been that visible to us before. Vax Design is a third transaction that we put together. This is a company where we formed a partnership about uh, 18 months ago, and uh, we liked the technology a lot. We ended up acquiring the company in September of 2010. This is a company that's developed a surrogate human immune system, basically a human immune system in a test tube or in a 96-well plate. It's called the Molecular Immune In Vivo Construct, or MIMIC technology. And it allows you to select product candidates more quickly than you normally could. And the lifeblood of getting your products to the market is being able to develop them quickly. So if there's anything that will save time in terms of selecting candidates, it becomes very useful. Uh, we're currently using the MIMIC technology to assess several vaccine candidates before we move them into phase one. And it also helps with the iterative cycle that you oftentimes go through. If you've got something in phase one and it doesn't quite have the characteristics that you want, you go back again, you identify another product candidate. Without going through all the animal testing, we can go through this kind of testing and determine no go or no go whether we want to move it into the clinic. So it's really, it, it's quite helpful. Vax design and now I would say Sanofi Pasteur also believe that animals may in fact be the best worst alternative that you can use, but that humans in a surrogate human immune system are the best best alternative that you can use in terms of selecting your product candidate. So we're, we're very excited about this technology.